three times. <laughs> well, good morning. Have you, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Have you ever said something that you immediately regretted? Yeah, I think most of us have, haven't we? Uh, when I was younger, I would consider myself a professional at getting my foot in my mouth. I mean, I had it down to a science. And then I got married, and all that changed. How about, have you ever said something, and then immediately you're like, I don't even agree with that. Have you ever done that? Have you ever said something, and immediately you're like, ah, I don't actually even think I believe that. Then stuck to your guns anyways? None of us have ever done that, right? Well, I'll tell you, it happened to me recently. In fact, it happened to me two weeks ago while I was preaching. Everybody's looking at me funny now. And I said something that immediately as I said it, I was like, like just something was like that. It, that doesn't, I don't, but, uh, and most of you probably would never even have noticed. You probably actually didn't even, didn't even register it. So what I said, as I said that I get to wake up every day with joy. Two weeks ago I was speaking on the overflowing joy of Jesus Christ coming out of us and just pouring out on everybody around us. And I was saying, like, I was trying to find something, and I was, I was just trying to find an analogy to help you understand just how awesome it is to just have Jesus Christ and be full of all this joy and energy and life. And what came to my mind was that I get to wake up every day with joy because I'm not going to hell. And then, immediately, in my heart and in my soul... I felt like something was wrong. And I didn't know what. And I, and I wasn't sure why. And I, I went home, and this was going through my head, and I just had this, this bad taste in my mouth. And I didn't know why. And, I'm, I, and I'm, just, I'm just reeling over it. In fact, I was almost a little embarrassed by it. And, and I'm, just, I'm just contemplating and contemplating and contemplating, going like, why is this not sitting with me? Why is this stirring my spirit? Why am I not comfortable with this? When in reality, there's some truth to it. It is true. But there's something just wrong in it. So I was sitting down with my wife and I was explaining to her, like, here's, here's this thing going on in my head. Like, and I don't really understand. And as we talked and I debriefed with her, I finally came to the realization that simply this. I was happy, or sorry, I came to the realization that, that simply this, that somewhere in my life, I'm still okay to just make it out of hell rather than live for heaven on earth. That somewhere in my life, I have a belief system that accepts that I am not worthy. That I am barely able. That I am the scum of the earth that will just make it in fire licking at my heels as I go to heaven. I have a belief system that suggests shame and guilt sit on me and weigh me down. The Bible says, out of your mouth the heart speaks. And as I was trying to search for words, that's what came to my mouth. And now I get to face it, which is exciting. Because I don't believe that we live by shame and guilt. I don't believe that we live to just make it out of hell. I believe that we find, and Jesus finds us, and we enter into a relationship, and we get to live for heaven on earth. That 
Hell shouldn't even be a part of my thinking. It shouldn't matter. It's gone anyways. Heaven should be my focus. Heaven on earth should be my focus. And so now I had to come to a realization that I I have to face this. And immediately I knew I was going to face it in front of you. Because maybe I'm not the only one on a journey of faith. Maybe I'm not the only one who hasn't made it yet to the end. Maybe we're all on a journey of faith together. My name, is, uh, my name is John. I'm one of the pastors here at Christian Life Fellowship. And this morning, we're going to be continuing on in a series that I, I have been starting. It's called Put Me In Coach. And what we've been, what we've been talking about in the series so far, I'll get into that in just a second. But, but what I want to try and get at is one of the key attributes of a Christian and a believer is us getting involved with what God is doing here on earth volunteering our time, service, and energy to what Jesus Christ is doing here on earth. And it doesn't matter how long you've been in the kingdom of God. Maybe you've only been a Christian for a couple of weeks. Maybe you've, only, maybe you've been a Christian your whole life. You've been coming to this church for 30, 40, 50 years. If you have, oh, thank you for joining us for so long. Um, and maybe you've only been coming for a couple of weeks. Maybe this is your first week. It doesn't matter. A part of a Christian's life and a journey is that we get involved with what God is doing outside of ourselves. And so one of the things that we're talking about is how exciting it is to get involved. And the things you can do to get involved are simple. I mean, maybe join a small group. Help out at some special functions that we have. We do several, like feeding, where we feed and bless people. Maybe, maybe helping out with some, some of the ministries. Maybe youth group is your thing. Not mine. That's okay. I love youth. They're fantastic. What about children's ministry? You ever want to be blessed? Like, I mean blessed. If you want to receive a blessing so great that you actually don't know what to do with it, go help out in children's ministry. Because it is the hardest and the best thing you'll ever do. Because when those kids start repeating the words of Jesus Christ in front of you, you will be blessed. I promise you that. Maybe it's helping out in one of our Sunday morning ministries that we have here. Maybe it's helping out as an usher, part of a, a, a team, a worship team. Getting involved and extending yourself outside of your, your, kind of your bubble is what Christians do. We give what we have received. And we have been given a lot. You know, <clears throat> excuse me. I realize that in my life, I have often lived to make it rather than succeed. And, and it's come out in a couple different ways in my life. I have, you know, maybe done something just good enough. Ah, it's good enough. How many of us have said that in our lives? The perfectionist in here is like, uh, it's good enough. It's close enough. See, with Christendom, we can do the same thing, can't we? Well, my faith is, my faith is good enough. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like, yeah, I'm, I'm good enough. I'll make it. I got a good 50%. Like, I am passing. And that's all that I can ask for right now. You ever felt that way? You see, a transformed mind and a transformed life in Jesus Christ will create life. Meaning that you are created to create life around you. You are recreated in Jesus when you believe in him. So this morning, we're going to be talking out of uh, Romans. No, nope. Oh, I've got to turn it on. Oh, there it is. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good 
pleasing and perfect will. Do not conform to the patterns of this world. You know, so often, I think we, we don't always understand what those kind of concepts mean. We often have made it seem like we need to hide away in a bubble where no one can see us. That would be not conforming to the patterns of this world. But the pattern of this world actually is something very unique. The pattern of this world is destructive, self-serving, like self-gratifying. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about these things in this world, and you can see it around you. Um, how many people see how greed affects people? You know, I, I was chatting the other day with one of the other pastors, and we were talking about, I don't know how we got onto this topic, but we were talking about lottery winners. You know, the average lottery winner is bankrupt after like a year and a half because greed changes you, because it's a sin. But be transformed. But now this word transformed, it's, uh, it has, there's only a couple places that it's used in the New Testament. And one of the places that it's used is when Jesus was transfigured on the mountain. So I'll give you a little context of that. Jesus took three disciples and he went up a mountain to pray. When he got to the top, he was transfigured into a heavenly being in front of their eyes. And two dead people showed up. Yeah, I believe that. They showed up and were there with him. And these three disciples were like, what am I looking at? Because they recognized these people. They were historical figures. And Jesus was transformed and heaven came to earth in that transformation. So the same word there is used when it's talking about being transformed here by the renewing of your mind. You see, we have been transformed. We have been transfigured. When you believe in Jesus Christ, you have been transformed into something that is no longer of this world. You have been transformed into a heavenly being, a king's kid, as they used to call them. Jesus Christ, Father God, Holy Spirit. You've been, we have been transformed into them, into their likeness. We've actually been remade. Now you might be thinking, well, hold on. I don't feel that way all the time. Yeah, that's fair. Neither do I. Why do you think I shared my story with you to start? Because it's a process. It takes time. We're on a journey. The best part about a journey is you get to walk the path set before you. So you look at it and you think, well, hold on, I'm, I'm not transformed. I'm not that way. Well, the truth is you actually have been transformed. That old you that you're thinking is still you is no longer you. You're made new. You are no longer you. You're something completely different. And it's the process of renewing your mind constantly that will guide you on that path. You see, the process of renewing your mind is always drawing yourself back to Jesus Christ and asking him and inviting him into you to help you love those around you. The object of renewing is to constantly be searching for God, for Jesus. This, this whole concept here that Paul uses is all about a continuous conversation that's never ending and never ceasing. But you have been transformed. You're not being transformed. You are transformed in Christ. And now you get to renew your mind daily with him. Sometimes, sometimes I think that it's easier for us to not renew our minds. 
I sometimes think that's what we think. I don't know, sometimes that's how I feel. Because anything worthwhile takes energy and time, right? Can we agree that's probably true? Anything worthwhile takes energy and time. Anything worthwhile in life has some sort of quote-unquote cost. And so it's like, man, you know, I could, you know, spend a little time with God every day. Or, or I could read the newspaper and drink a coffee. I could spend some time with the Lord. Or I could watch TV at night while I sleep. I could, I could, you know, read my Bible at lunch. Or, or... I could sit on my phone on Facebook. I could. I could. But, you know, I'm making it. You ever had that thought? I'll be honest, I have. Because I'm not perfect. (laughs) I'm being transformed, you guys. I'm being renewed. I'm not perfect. It takes work for me every day. And that's why I'm here talking to you about it. I'm on a journey. And one of the ways that you can renew your mind is actually to give of yourself. I know that sounds surprising because we would think that it's all about receiving. That often there's a correlation with, well, I just need to receive more from God before I can give. When in reality, actually, it often works the other way around. You actually got to give to receive. You have to give to receive. And you don't give to receive. If you give, you will receive because God is good. And he wants to bless you. He wants to pour out goodness and good things in your life. But it takes giving. It takes serving. It takes doing. It takes action. Using what he's given you, whether you believe it or not, and he will pour out in you. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. Now here's the thing. Focus on hell and just making it out of hell, you'll never know the will of God. Because that's not, God doesn't live in shame and guilt. A focus on being happy to get out of hell is a mindset that is focused on all the things that's wrong with you. A life, a mind, focused on being happy to get out, just to get out of hell, is a life that is focused on all that's wrong with you. You don't look at yourself and are happy. You don't look at yourself and have joy. You look at yourself as a worm that is just thankful to God. Actually, David, one of the psalmists in in Psalms, he calls himself that before Jesus. That's what that is. A life focused on heaven will know the will of God. A life focused on heaven and heavenly things will know the will of God, you guys. Have you ever asked, okay, God, what am I supposed to do? Where are you calling me? What are you asking me to do? Have you ever asked that question? I know lots of us have. I've asked that question many times. Like, God, where are you sending me? My wife and I, when we were living in Victoria, um, I didn't actually ask the Lord, he told me. When we were living in Victoria, he clearly said, you need to move to Nanaimo. And we're like, why are we moving to Nanaimo? He's like, I'm not going to tell you. He didn't say that, but he didn't tell me. So I assume it was something along those lines. And so he didn't tell us. He said, you move to Nanaimo. And we're like, okay, we're moving to Nanaimo. My wife got a practicum for her last uh, student education thing in Nanaimo, one of the schools. I, I was already working in Nanaimo, driving every day back and forth from Victoria. So it was like, okay, God, you're taking us here. And we went to a spiritual drought. We went from awesome friends, loving, serving, receiving from God 
I was being mentored to nothing, to a desert. I'm like, God, what do you send us here for? Why are we here? For eight months. And only in hindsight can I tell you, the Lord is smarter than you and I. <laughs> because eight months of us going, God, what are you doing? Did he reveal that he actually was waiting for us to ask? And he had to send us somewhere where it wasn't easy to access, just so that we could talk, so he could talk to us. And we came here. That was seven years ago. The Lord took us into a drought so that we would come after him. Because he knew we would. But when, anyways, that's just our story. But have you ever asked and gotten no answer? It's not fun, is it? You're not going to hear from God if you're focusing on your shame and guilt and everything wrong from you. Not the way you want, anyways. He might speak to you and, and heal you. But what you're looking for, those answers of what to do, where to go, how do I get there, what does it look like, who do, who do I got to talk to, how do I get the skills and abilities, all those questions that you're asking yourself, that comes from taking your focus off of everything that's wrong with you and realizing that's gone. Because that's what, you are transformed. You have been transformed. That's all gone. Can we still struggle in the f flesh and have difficulties in life? Yes. Are we going to be perfect in this world? No. Should we strive for perfection? Yes. People say, well, why strive for it if, you, if you're not going to make it? You know, that saying, shoot for the stars, and if you miss, you'll be floating in space forever. <laughs> Sorry. Shoot for the stars. Shoot for perfection. Are we going to make it? I don't think so. I, I don't. Not until we die. I don't think we'll be perfect until we die. But God says, shoot for it anyways. Shoot for it anyways. Focus on heaven. Focus on what's good about you. Focus on what's right about you. Don't focus on all the things that's bad about you. Don't let your shame and your guilt dictate you and your identity. Let Jesus tell you who you are. Now, some of you may be sitting here going and having shame and guilt about having shame and guilt. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not trying to encourage you to have shame and guilt about having shame and guilt. That's not what I'm saying. This isn't a berating thing. I shared my testimony at the start about how I didn't agree with something and now I'm here talking about it. So you know, I don't have any shame and guilt about that. Why would I? I said it and I went, no, nah, I don't agree with it. And I'm going to leave it behind and move on. Let heaven be your focus. Not, not what you can't do. Not what you can't do. Because God's will is perfect. And when you act with heaven in mind, regardless of what you do, you're going to see what God is calling you to. When you serve with heaven in mind, God is going to reveal to you this stuff. When you give with heaven in mind, God will enlighten you and give you wisdom. When you love others with heaven in mind, it goes much further than just as a prerequisite to get out of hell. You hear what I'm saying? So I'm going to give you a an idea how to do that. So, one of the concepts that we, uh, 
that I like to kind of flesh out. And I'm going to tell you a story first. So there's this lady, uh, Corey Ten Boone. Have anybody heard her name before? She's uh, now no longer living and in heaven. She, is, she was a uh, German. Uh, she was living in Holland. She's Dutch. She was living in Holland during the Second World War. Her and her sister and her whole family were carted off to concentration camps. She went to one herself with her sister. Her sister died in a concentration camp. And she lived a life full of faith and joy. She lived a life like I could only hope or dream to live. I mean that. She lived a life that was focused on Jesus. It didn't matter what anybody else was doing. Jesus was the only thing that mattered in her life. And after all of that, in 1946, I'm pretty sure, so a year after the war ended, she went to Munich, Germany to tell people about Jesus because everybody deserves grace. And there she was in Germany and an, a guard, one of the SS guards that was at their concentration camp came up to her and he said, I've become a Christian. I'm here to ask for forgiveness. I'm here to ask for forgiveness, he said. So think about this Dutch lady who was in a concentration camp with her sister who died in that very camp. This man was a guard, and one of the worst by her accounts. One of the meanest. One of the most brutal. And she says, I prayed. God, I can't do this. I can't. What I can do is I can lift my hand and I can shake his hand. But the feeling of, of forgiveness, I, I can't do. I need you to do it for me. Because I can't. I can't do it. So she stretched out her hand and took the man's, and she said it was like, like a burning from her hand up her arm into her shoulder and then through her body. And God delivered her forgiveness for this man. And it, she, she cried out, I forgive you, and wrapped her arms around him in love. Not under her own power. She leveraged the goodness of God before she received it. Do you get that? She loaned against a promise that was yet to come to see God's goodness knowing that his goodness would come through. Knowing that it was not going to be under her power, but she was going to do it anyways. Because she knows she serves a good God. And if you want to know how to live a transformed life and be constantly renewed, leverage the goodness of God before you have received it. Loan against it is a better way of saying it. Loan against it. You know what's coming. Loan against it. Borrow against it. Borrow against it. Even if you don't believe it, borrow it against it. If you want to be transformed, if you want your mind to constantly be renewed so you can see the will of God and you don't have joy in your life, borrow against the joy of the Lord. Because guess what? I'll get you to skip ahead here. Sinatha, thank you. One more if you could. Because the Holy Spirit's going to produce stuff in you. Holy Spirit wants to produce in you life and life to the fullest. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. He wants to pour out his fruit in your life. And he wants to pour it out for people around you. She skipped past it. I'll just paraphrase it. Freely you have been given. Freely give. But the Holy Spirit will produce in you this kind of fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Come on. Isn't that how you want to live? That's how I want to live. 
And there's things in there I'm going to have to borrow against to be able to succeed. How about in your marriage? What do you need to borrow against to love your spouse better? What do you need to borrow against? Is it self-control? Is it patience? Is it learning how to be gentle? What is it? Borrow against it before you have it. Because his goodness is there for you. Loan against these things. That's, that is honestly how you can renew your mind daily. Some people call it a declaration. Meaning that you speak truth over yourself rather than believing lies. I am a joyful person. How many of you might struggle with saying that? kind of feel like sand and dirt in your mouth. And you're like, ever go to the beach and you get a mouthful of sand? You're like, nothing you can do can get it out. That might be how it feels the first few times you say that. But as you borrow against it, as you loan against it, you will start to receive it. Because he wants to give it to you. He wants to give you peace. He wants to give you patience. How about with that coworker? They always comes up with the same thing and you're, ugh, every time. How about gentleness, kindness, and patience? I will be gentle to them. I will be kind with them. Renew your mind. Renew your mind. Could you imagine with me what it would be like if we as a church did this. Think about it with me. My favorite thing to do is to dream ridiculously large dreams because God could do them. Can. I might not be at the center of it like I am in my own dreams. You're supposed to laugh at that. God can do ridiculous things. And it starts with you recognizing you are transformed. And that shame and guilt you might be feeling right now, start saying to yourself, I am have been made worthy by Jesus Christ. I have been made whole by Jesus Christ. I have been made right with God through Jesus Christ. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. And with that comes love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. I can because heaven is in front of me. And I want as many people to join me as I possibly can. Because when heaven's in front of you, you're not looking at the fire behind you. You're looking at who you can bring with you. Because nobody wants to go alone, do we? I don't want to go to heaven alone. I want to bring as many people with me as I possibly can. And if you want to grow, serve. If you want to grow in your journey of faith, find a place to serve. Because that's how you'll grow. If you want to hear more from God, serve. It's simple. If you don't put yourself in a position for God to activate the gifts in your life, it's really hard to hear him. Put yourself in his way so he can speak to you. Amen? Amen. Well, I'm going to pray and invite the worship team, rest of the worship team to come up. We're just going to, we're going to respond in worship this morning. Lord, we just thank you. God, that in all things, Father, your 
faithfulness will endure. Holy Spirit, we thank you that we can trust in you. We thank you that we no longer live to get out of hell, but to bring heaven to earth. We thank you that you poured yourself out for us and that you told us to loan against your goodness in our lives. You told us to seek your goodness in our lives. Father, we just accept the challenge you've set before us. The challenge of loving others as much as you've loved us and more. And we thank you that you've made us worthy.